I bought my first house when I was 24 years old. I felt like I was living the dream. Whose dream exactly? I wasn't sure, but I'd been ticking off boxes from that proverbial adulting checklist at rapid fire pace. I moved out of my small hick town, check. I attended college and graduated on time, check. I'd gotten my teaching credential, check. I landed a job utilizing my degree and my credential, teaching high school journalism and English, check. I even met a man at Starbucks, no less. How's that for a perfect rom-com inspired meet cute? Take that, Meg Ryan. I'd been hyper-focused on doing all the things to make me look like a grown-up on paper, despite feeling like a surly teenager masquerading in an adult's body. Closing on my house was the perfect bow on my oh-so-grown-up life. I had the man, the job, the starter home. What more could I ask for? When Nick dropped to one knee and asked me to be his wife, I said yes without hesitation. We were in love. I knew he'd asked my dad for permission, and my mom had let it slip that my grandma had given him her ring. Marriage was the next step, right? And of course, a dog, you know, as the starter child. <laughs> I knew I wasn't quite ready for the responsibilities of a puppy, but I was ready to progress our relationship. Nick and I were so young when we started dating. We weren't really grown-ups at all. We were 22-year-olds who were more concerned with partying, sleeping in, and soaking up our hangovers with breakfast burritos. And while I had started to rub the late-night booze crusties out of my eyes and shifted to healthier habits, Nick seemed determined to live out our early 20s in a blaze of alcohol and pot-induced glory. But I clearly had some kind of selective amnesia, forgetting about everything that contradicted my idea of the perfect happily ever after, because here he was, validating my self-worth by wanting to put a ring on it. And a life that had a husband in it, even if I had to constantly clean up after him and swat him on the snout with rolled up newspaper, sounded a lot more appealing than being alone forever, which was obviously the only other option for a mid-twenties spinster like me. We hadn't always been a mess. The first couple years of our relationship had been great. It wasn't until I bought the house and we moved in together that things truly started to unravel. Nick lost his job. At first, he told me it was because the company was downsizing, but after months of him dawdling in his job search, spending most of his days playing video games, he confessed to me that he'd gotten fired for lying about his qualifications. It turns out that he did not, in fact, have a bachelor's degree. He had two-thirds of a degree, but had been kicked out and moved back home. But he had a plan his parents agreed to fund the rest of his education as long as he got a part-time job to help pay the bills. Our bills. Nick's shortcomings, though, paled in comparison to my fear of being alone. I decided to disregard his dishonesty and try and support him. I had started working at the kids club at 24 Hour Fitness, mostly because I have absolutely no chill, but also to help pay for my master's degree. My club manager was able to pull a few strings and help Nick get a position at a neighboring gym. The biggest benefit to Nick working at the gym was that he'd often work out before and after his shifts. There had been a direct correlation between Nick's expanding waistline and the length of his unemployment, so I was happy to see that he had abandoned his beer and McDonald's diet in favor of healthier habits. Our gym with benefits relationship, though, was short-lived. Nick made a habit of requesting Chargers football time off, a strategy his manager quickly caught on to, and when he wasn't granted the time off he wanted, he'd simply call in sick an MO that quickly landed him on absolutely everyone's shit list. 
But given the fact that the Chargers were a shitty football team, they didn't make a shitty short-lived playoff run, and it seemed that Nick and his shitty work ethic managed to survive the regular NFL season. (laughs) One Saturday in late April, while Nick was working, I called his gym only to find out he'd been fired in February. Hours later, he breezed through the door in his snappy polyester 24-hour fitness polo. How was work? I asked casually. He launched into his story about two women fighting over the last pass for Zumba and how he had had to intervene and keep the two lycra-clad foes from tearing each other limb from spandexed limb. Huh, I said. That's really weird. Yeah, he agreed. It wasn't even one of the popular instructors. (laughs) It's even weirder because I called the gym today. The color drained from his face, and he tucked his tail between his legs and looked for a corner of the room to retreat to. They said you were let go in February, Nick. Have you been pretending to go to work for three months? He lowered his eyes and let out a whimper. They wouldn't give me the Super Bowl off, he whined. (laughs) So where have you been going when you told me you were going to work? To my parents' house, he said. He looked up at me with these sad, pleading, take pity on me eyes that I knew worked on his parents, but They weren't going to work on me. All the chances I had given him suddenly seemed like such a joke. Why was I fighting to keep this relationship afloat? This lie and the months of betrayal afterwards helped me realize that this sad little puppy was simply incapable of becoming an alpha or even a beta dog. He'd likely be making messes for someone else to clean up for the rest of his life. I think you should probably just go back to your parents' house, I said. I left him standing there, stunned, and locked myself in the bathroom where I could run the shower and sob without him hearing me. I didn't want him to know how hurt I was. I I just wanted him gone. I could only hope that he wasn't going to tear apart our bedroom and chew on my shoes out of spite. (laughs) There was one outstanding problem, though. He still had my grandma's ring, which he'd taken to get resized for me. He ignored my pleas to return the ring for weeks. It was only after a desperate phone call to his mom that I was able to get it back. He unceremoniously dropped the red velvet box in the mail slot while I was at work and I nestled the box among my clothes as I packed for a trip home. Just days later, I fished the small box out of my purse and I placed it in my grandma's shaking palm. She clasped her hand over mine and squeezed. I'm sorry, Jesse, she said. I'm sorry he wasn't the one, but I want you to know, you can do better. My smart girl can do so much better, she said. I watched her pry open the red velvet lid and stare down at its contents. And a look of confusion clouded her expression. Jesse, she said, this isn't my ring. She handed the box back to me and I peered inside. She was right. The ring was a simple gold band with a tiny flake of a stone mounted on it. It looked like it came from a Cracker Jacks box. It bore no resemblance to the ornate Art Deco ring that I had inherited. My heart plummeted into the pit of my stomach. That evening, I called Nick. He didn't answer. I texted and I emailed too, and I continued to do so for weeks. Finally, I enacted the only strategy that seemed to work. I called his mom. I tried to calmly explain things to her, but I was borderline hysterical. I'd grown closer with his mom than I'd ever been with my own, and I was certain she'd have my back. An email from Nick 
popped into my inbox less than an hour later. My mom says she doesn't want you to contact her anymore. It started. It was an invisible gut punch that still managed to knock the wind out of me. I'm sorry you're not happy with the ring I gave you. I replaced your ring because I knew you wouldn't be happy with the original one. I, I didn't have enough money to buy you something that would be good enough, so I traded the ring for more money. But then I had to spend the money to pay you rent. When you asked for it back, I got some money, and I bought you the one as a replacement. Sorry, it's not good enough for you. I immediately texted him, demanding to know where he traded the ring and how I could get it back. This was not fucking Pogs or Pokemon cards. You don't trade someone's family heirloom. Dots appeared on the text screen. Then they disappeared. Then they reappeared. I waited, not even realizing I was holding my breath. Pawn shop on El Cajon was the reply that eventually materialized, followed by blocking you now. I rolled my eyes and tried not to panic. How many pawn shops were there on El Cajon Boulevard? <laughs> Too many, it turned out, all of which were dead ends. After endless phone calls, it was apparent that the hunt for my grandma's ring was going to be as elusive and disappointing as a Chargers football season. <laughs> it was gone. I had to call my grandma and admit defeat. It's okay, Jesse, she cooed into the phone. It's just a piece of jewelry. It's not okay, I wailed. He stole it, and he sold it, and he lied about it, and it's not fair, and it's not right. It's not right, but it's done, she said matter-of-factly. Don't you waste another single tear on that boy, Jesse, she ordered. It wasn't until years later after my grandma had passed away, that I found out how she'd been so calm as she'd consoled me. After my visit, my grandma called Nick herself. She'd initially threatened legal action, but decided it wasn't worth the effort of small claims court. Nick's parents had promised he'd pay her back for the ring. My grandma, never received anything from Nick. After getting another part-time job, Nick had been so distraught over his guilt that his parents decided he needed to focus on his mental health. Rather than forcing him to take responsibility for his actions, they bought him a puppy to help him feel better. And he continued to live with them, rent-free, well into his 30s, until another unsuspecting, well-intentioned woman adopted him and attempted to train him. <laughs> Even though I know my grandma would tell me to let this shit go, I am still incredibly angry at Nick, but even more so at myself. It should have been clear to me that this dog was not going to learn any new tricks. He'd been raised to be selfish and irresponsible, and he wasn't going to change just because I wanted him to, no matter how many treats I fed him. I know I'm not perfect. I am loud, I am bossy, and I put glitter on fucking everything. <laughs> but I take care of myself. I own my shit when I'm out of line, and, well, I'm not going to apologize for the glitter, but I don't expect my parents or anyone else to clean up my messes or to buy me a puppy when I'm sad. I realize that being a grown-up kind of sucks. I've abandoned that checklist and focus on what actually makes me happy, hence the glitter. <laughs> I've grown comfortable and even confident in being on my own, and I've accepted that I can't save every lost puppy that wanders into my life. But... If I'm being completely honest, I'd be lying if I didn't admit that I got a dog, too. And while she's a bit of a freeloader, she's never lied to me. Let's hear it for Jessica Young. <laughs>